Oh, Rob. Yeah, mate. I've got the job card for that black club sport. Yep. Um, there it is. No worries. What are we doing with that? It's a full thing. Supercharger, head and cam, clutch, fuel system. Hold it. Okay, we got all the parts for that? All the parts are here. Oh, beautiful. All right. Um, and uh, Don't forget to do the before run. Oh, right. Yeah, no worries. All right. I've got the XR8 on the dyno at the moment, so as soon as I get that done, I'll get that um, before run. Um, all right. No worries, mate. Great. Talk Cheers. to you later. How are you going with this? Nah, it's all good, it's all good. E everything I needed you to do is done? Everything's done except the line locker. Okay, cool. Because you know what I want to do a wussy burnout summon at? The only thing that would make you do a wussy burnout is you, Robbie. Come on, Marty. You know, there's a lot of people, uh, you know, already giving me a fair bit of stick about it. So, uh, I don't want to be blaming you because I haven't got enough power or something's not right. No, nah, the car's going to have plenty of power and it's going to be reliable. And the only thing that's going to stop you doing a good burnout is you. All We've right. seen you do burnouts before and they're not that good, you know. <laughs> Now, um, there's a VZ out in the car park there. Can you get a before run done on that as soon as you get this off? No worries. All right, mate. I'll do that now. Hey, uh, Robbie, can we take it out and do a bit of a skid in the street for do this test it out? Irresponsible, Marty. Oh, come on. Wuss. What I've got here is my little secret weapon that I've had the boys fit. This is what's commonly known as a line lock. Basically, it's an electronic solenoid that um, stops the brake fluid traveling down the line and activating the rear brake. So by simply pushing a button on the dash, it operates that solenoid. I put my foot on the brake pedal and only the front brakes actually are activated. Obviously that's gonna help me a lot when I'm trying to do a burnout because I don't have the resistance of the back brakes trying to slow the wheels down. And the other thing is that I can go along and hit the brakes um, and only be controlling the front brakes, which helps me with steering in that. So um, don't tell anyone, but this is my little secret that boys um, have fitted on there and I reckon that might make all the difference just to make in the finals. We'll see. Okay, we've got our BAXR8 ute here on the dyno getting all set up for Summonats. Now the main objective to this year at Summonats is to go out there and have some fun. We've got Robbie going to drive this thing in the burnout comp. Hopefully he's not a big wuss and he does a decent sort of job. But what, what I'm trying to do here now is set this car up so it's nice and safe so it's not going to hurt it while he's doing it. Uh, we're going to put some good fuel in it. We're going to pull a little bit of boost out of it from what we've been running in the past. We're going to turn on the fans so they run continuously regardless of speed or anything else. Even when the engine's cold, we'll have the fans running uh, and get it all good, safe, and still, it still makes plenty of power. I'm not going to have any problem with doing a good burnout, so if there is a poor burnout, it's all Robbie, not the car. All right, what we're doing is, uh, in the past, the only options for tuning the Fords have been the Kappa flash box, and that's, in the past, what we've been using here. It's one of these, so basically we can put three programs into this. You can have a performance program, an economy program, and a valet program, for example. Uh, and now that there's been a new product that's just been released, which uh, we're giving a try on this car now. Uh, basically, what this enables us to do is flash directly to the car. Uh, instead of having to flash the box and then the box flash the car, with this new software, we can directly flash straight into the car. It's got its own logger for enabling us to, to log all the engine parameters and make sure everything's doing what it's supposed to be doing. And uh, the layout is much easier and nicer for us to use so we can find our way around what we're trying to do, what we're trying to find, much quicker and much easier. I think we're just about set now to uh, give it one last run and then uh, we're set to go up to Summonats and have some fun.
last of the um, supercharger kit just unpacked. Eight rib pulley kit. As you can see, it comes pretty, uh, pretty complete and very spiffy looking. Front mounted heat exchanger kit with its own reservoir. Even a uh, nice little logo sticker there when you're showing your mates. Plumbing kit, 2.3 litre blower, which is the big daddy. Comes already complete with the larger injectors already fitted. Um, as opposed to most blowers, this one runs the shaft underneath and drives at the back. So, just a bit different. Looks nice. Um, intake, a couple of bracketries, and a different belly plate with countersunk holes, just to make it a little bit easier for me so I don't have to go machining up the one that's already on there. And that's it. About to fit the supercharger on now. Just um, tension the belt on the rear here and swap a few sensors onto the throttle body from the original manifold. And then we'll drop it on. Thing I've been lifting amber weights. Need the strength just to get it on. Finally finished the fuel system on the supercharged club sport we're doing. This is running a Bosch motorsport fuel pump and an external surge tank. Although factory fuel tank does have a surge canister inside it. Um, when the tank gets low, we can't guarantee fuel around it. So um, this one, we've put an external one where we can. Also, we've got the Harrop diff cover. This has moved the uh, mounts out to the sides to try and alleviate axle cramp and also a larger oil capacity to uh, stop overheating in track use. As you can notice, he's um, also fitted a twin three-inch exhaust system which is um, highly desirable on forced induction application uh, to get maximum exhaust flow. Righto, <clears throat> pretty much the last bit. Uh, just fill, fill in, finishing off the coolant. As you can see, the air box is missing, which is a little bit of a shame because this has really got to go tomorrow. So hopefully it gets here still. Now, as you can see, I've finished wiring it all up. Blower's fully bolted down. Eight rib pulleys and belts now on and fitted. Heat exchangers on the front. And that is pretty much the last legs of this whole process, which has included heads, cam, clutch, fuel system, diff cover, supercharger, upgrade, to the uh, drive belt system and pretty much ready to fire it up. Uh, performance sales manager. Um, in the performance industry, I've been about uh, about 10 years. Mechanic for about uh, 18. Yeah. I've everything from a 1948 Plymouth with a 253 in it, which we drove to the summit, that's with no rojo plates, made it all the way there and back. Um, had a Mark 1 Escort with a Windsor in it. 
That was good fun. A um, couple of Monaros, like late model Monaros. Actually, a couple of early model Monaros. Um, the late model ones, one of them got stolen in Perth. That made 440 kilos of the wheels in like 2001, so it was a pretty tough car then. Um, and the second one, we put a 3.3 litre Whipple on it. Went 10.3 at 138. Sold that engine and built a 402 cube with two turbochargers. And that made about 750 horsepower at the wheels on pump fuel. Oh, there's, there's been a lot. Probably running a 10.3 was pretty cool. Yeah, the car was, was rock solid and kept doing it all day. It was, it was good fun. Got a VXSS. Um, Want to do a bit of sort of club racing with it and just keep it a bit more tame and registered and safe and that sort of thing. Just I'll put an engine in it towards the middle of the year and just try and do some stuff at the track. I want to put an LS3 in it with a camshaft in it and maybe some heads on it. Make 330 at the wheels, something like that, be good fun. Okay, one of the questions we get asked all the time here at Horsepower Factory is about intercooling and why we need it, what is it, what types of intercooling there is. There's three main types of intercooling. There's air to water, which we've got here. Um, there's dry ice and there's uh, air to air, which is probably the most common. And I'll show you the other two examples later. But this, this is our XR8 ute. And on this, we're running um, an air to water intercooler because we're going to a, a yellow Terra positive displacement supercharger kit, which actually, with it, which actually comes with an air to water intercooler. Um, the way the air to wa water intercooler works is you've got um, a heat exchanger at the front here, which you can see behind the bar. Um, you've got water lines feeding water out of that um, into uh, another heat exchanger which is sitting in this billet plate here, um, which is actually the, the heat exchanger that's removing the heat out of the air. And the reason we've got to remove the heat out of the air is basically for every pound of boost that we uh, uh, develop uh, through the supercharger, we're creating about um, 10 degrees of temperature. Uh, which is just a, a law of physics. It's just as you compress air, the molecules um, rub together and uh, it heats up the air. So basically, um, uh, we've got the heat exchanger in here. You've got water running through that, which is pulling the heat out of the air. Um, it then comes out the back um, and is run back into the heat exchanger at the front. Obviously, air passing through as you're driving down the road or track um, is pulling the heat out of that via the uh, aluminium heat exchanger or radiator. Um, and so on the cycle keeps going around. Um, it, it's, a, it's a fairly simple system. The, the, the air to water system is very good for drag racing. It's very good for um, uh, where you've got maybe an ice chest and you can really pull the temperature of the water down. Um, one of the downsides is once you get heat into the water, it's very hard to get the heat out. And that's where, say, an air to air intercooler on the road would be better because it's more consistent, maintains its intake temperatures better. Um, whereas an air to water, as I said, would probably run slightly higher intake temperatures due to the fact that it, it struggles to get the heat out of the water once uh, it does get the heat into it. This has got a front man intercooler. Normally they come out with a top man intercooler that sits up on top of the engine, but this customers fitted a, a front mount air to air intercooler, which is what I wanted to show you. You can see, this is good because you can see the turbo up there, you can see the piping winding down, feeding air out of the turbocharger into the intercooler, which the air moves through the intercooler, out of the intercooler, um, up through the piping and into the throttle body. You can see that uh, it's very, very simple and that's the thing I like about uh, air to air intercoolers for, for road cars is there's no moving parts. It's not like a air to water intercooler where you've got um, water pumps and things that are electrical that I suppose potentially could fail and, and they do from time to time. With this, it's, there's no moving parts. You've got a, a core, piping and that's it. And the best part about an air to air is as I said earlier, they're very consistent in their intake temps. And you'd see on the road, say if this was running, um, you know, 15 pounds of boost, um, the intake temps on this would probably be around 40 degrees rather than 150 degrees that they should have been if, um, if, they were, if it was running your 15 pounds of boost. So um, you can see that there's some real benefits with running an air to air. Now, what I'll do now is I'll just take you over and show you the dry ice, which is the, the mother of all intercoolers. And, um, for drag racing and dyno stuff, it is the ultimate. So we'll go and have a look at that now.
Okay, then this is the uh, the big mother of all intercoolers and dry ice. Now you've seen this on the show before. Um, this car obviously is purpose built for dynoing and we're trying to maximise our intercooling efficiency to make as much power as possible and this technology is pretty new to us. It's something we really only started dabbling in at the Summer Nats um, sort of two years ago and um, it's something that we've really had to get a handle on. It, uh, you're talking figures that are just mind boggling, minus 70 degrees. I mean, you know, <laughs> to get an in intercooler air intake temps down to zero degrees is unbelievable. This thing gives us control to bring it down to minus 70. In actual fact, we don't intercool it as much as we, uh, as we used to. We actually now start the runs at around zero degrees and go uh, down to about minus 10 at the end of the run. And we found that that is the optimum for us. Now, it again really is the same principle. We're moving hot air that's being generated out of the turbochargers through the, uh, the intercooler here. You can see there's fins or cores that basically run from the top to the bottom. Um, went before the run, we'll pack dry ice in and around that. This actually, believe it or not, will hold 30 kilograms of dry ice. Um, we generally don't run that much because that will give us too much intercooling. We normally run probably around 10 to 15 kilos. And um, the air running through obviously is cooled by the, um, the dry ice um, cooling the uh, core. Um, it then air is then exiting on the other side of the intercooler up into the intake manifold. And when you see this thing in full flight, you'll actually see the ice starting to freeze up the uh, intercooler pipe and even the throttle body in the front half of the manifold um, just because of the amount of uh, um, uh, how cool the uh, temperature is that's uh, being um, generated in the intercooler. So um, this is the ultimate. Um, I suppose there's a few things being uh, dry ice. It is dangerous. You've got to be a little bit careful with it. You've got to handle it with care and wear gloves and stuff. Um, it does give off CO2 and that's why we actually have this cover here that we always run on the top there. And you can see it's got some vents in the top. Um, as the dry ice melts, it gives off CO2 gas. Now CO2 gas, if that was just to basically vent straight into the turbo, would replace oxygen and reduce the amount of power the engine would make. So we're very careful to make sure that uh, we cover that up and we vent it where we want it to be vented, which is down in, uh, underneath the car. So um, dry ice technology is, is an absolute awesome technology. It's no good for driving around on the street. The problem with obviously is that the dry ice would melt way too quick and you'd have no intercooling or limited intercooling. But um, for any sort of application where it's um, dyno or drag racing, um, dry ice, there's no doubt it's the ultimate. You're never going to get intake temps as low as you're going to get with a dry ice intercooler. And uh, we're very lucky to be able to play around with this. And Richard at ARE uh, up in Queensland had a massive amount of to do with its development. And uh, I think we've helped him a fair bit along the way. But that is the big daddy. You can see uh, it's one awesome piece of gear. And um, it's probably, I hope what I've explained to you today is sort of, you know, giving you a little bit of insight to intercooling.